Today, I'm joined by Blake Masters. He is a venture capitalist, um, the president of the Thiel Foundation, uh, and the co-author of a book you probably have heard of if you're tangentially involved in tech or startups in any way, uh, Zero to One, uh, which is probably one of the maybe the most famous startup book or the most, yeah, just a, a core um, source of information um, for, for anyone trying to build a business. So um, welcome, Blake. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You are also currently running for um, U.S. Senate uh, in Arizona. How's that been going? How how is that compared to uh, working in startups? You know, well, which which one has been a bit uh, you know more more complex? Well, first question first. It's going well. You know, I'm I'm never uh, complacent. You know, I know in some sense I'm the underdog, or at least I have to act like it every day and, and work hard because it'll be hard. Uh, you know, I'm trying to beat Mark Kelly, who's an incumbent Democrat senator. And I think this is the most, uh, this Arizona Senate race is the most important Senate race uh, in the country. And the Dems are going to do everything they can to, to keep it. So it'll be hard, but I'm, I'm up and to the right, getting traction, I think doing well, because um, I'm not a conventional politician. You know, I'm for better or worse, I'm not boring and I'm not going to just do all the same standard stuff all those other guys do. But um, it is interesting, like in so many ways, a campaign is like a startup. Um, I think the path is a little bit more clear. And in a startup, you have to, you know, really just make your own path. So there's, there's sort of a cookie cutter, you know, um, set of guidelines to follow in a campaign. But I'm also breaking a lot of those, right? And, and my whole attitude is, uh, you know, as cliche as it might sound, trying to be the zero to one attitude. Like, how do I be the kind of candidate that no one's ever seen before? Um, you know, I don't want to compete with all the other guys who are running. I just want to transcend them. And that's my mentality. That's how I'm approaching not just sort of media and communications, but also fundraising, which is why I'm doing new and innovative things there. Ultimately, yeah, I can think of a lot of differences. Campaign is not quite like a startup, right? But but there are more similarities, at least the way I'm doing it. There's more similarities than than I would have even thought. And so that's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, th there's definitely a, a huge um, pool of, of uh, efficiency that you can draw from, from Silicon Valley. I mean, there's, uh, politics tends to be, um, tends to have kind of like traditional ways of, of yeah, going about it, which are very much relationship focused, but I guess they're missing quite a lot of the, um, the data part, the, even, even people management. I think there's so much stuff going on in Silicon Valley that, you know, the, the campaign trail has never seen. So you're probably more, more well equipped than, than most to do that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And, you know, I guess we won't know until I win, but I do think I'm tracking to to do just that. And people are just tired of conventional politics, conventional politicians. Right. And, um, I don't know why I, I actually do know why I do know why everybody sounds the same out there. It's like, as soon as I got into the race, you know, the consultants sort of descend upon you and here's your two page border plan. And here's your, you know, talking points for big tech. And it's like, no guys, I know big tech. Like I know these companies, like how many people do I know at Facebook and Google? Um, I've, I've observed how these companies have grown over time and I've observed the pathologies and the things that don't work. And like, I feel like I deeply know this stuff and yeah, you know, I, I, I think about like, how can I translate my knowledge into, you know, good bits of communication to help a voter understand that what the problem is, why I can be trusted to address it. And here's what we're going to do. But it's not the consultant provided talking points. But most candidates, they're they're just like, oh, I want to run for Congress, I want to run for Senate, and uh, maybe they have an impressive background, but they don't they don't have that knowledge about politics generally, or you know, all too often about any specific thing. And so the consultants just give them the talking points, and they memorize the talking points, and everybody sounds like a robot. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah, that that, that sounds like it. Yeah. Um, I can tell that you're not being fed talking points by the fact that you um, you have some some out of the box positions, which I've not heard many people uh, take. Uh, for example, CRT is anti-white. That's I've that's one thing that you know you 
you're the only person saying that in a in a stark way and saying that you know you're coming out with it and uh, and presenting that as a yeah as a as a self evident thing and it is a self evident thing for anyone who who manages to you know muster the courage to actually point it out so do you feel like that the fact that you're saying the unsayable you're noticing the unnoticeable uh, is that uh, is that giving you an edge in your campaign or or have you taken any hits from it um both but actually take far fewer hits than you fear. I think this is always true. Like the hits I'll take in the future and this month or this year will be really crazy, right? Because it's the election year and we're going to have people spend millions of dollars against me, both on the Republican and the Democratic side. But the hits that I'll take are going to be like fake. You know, they're going to be like, Blake is Peter Thiel's puppet, you know, like whatever, man. Like nobody, nobody actually thinks that. In terms of like taking controversial but true positions, because they're true, right? No one can really hit you on it. Like, good luck with that. Good luck criticizing me for saying critical race theory is anti-white. It obviously is. And so if you can cross the threshold, if you can muster the courage to say things that are yet true, uh, but bold, and half the people are going to love them and half the people are going to hate them, I think you just win. Like haters pile on, but it's never about the substance. Yeah. Um, because I think we're just right. And that's the power, right? I'm learning. It's like the, the power is the elephant in the room. And I think, um, you know, in so many different contexts, the reason things don't work in our society is because like, we're not good at talking about elephants in the room and dealing with them. Instead, we pretend um, that they don't exist. And we focus on all these other fake, you know, problems, often like virtue signaling about them. And if you just talk frankly about the elephant in the room, sort of like people do at their dinner tables, you know, when the cameras are off, um, I think that comes across as not only honest and refreshing, but somehow like the future, the future of politics, because we can't keep just, you know, walking in zombie like fashion, beating our heads into a wall, like we have to change some things. And this was the power of Trump to me. You know, I mean, he's he's sort of uh, a genius in many respects, I think, but like no one could ever accuse President Trump of saying something he didn't believe, you know, like it was just radical honesty, maybe too radical for some people. And like, it upsets a lot of people when you're honest, but like, that's the lesson is just be bold and you say things that are true, uh, but also somehow, you know, that you're not allowed to say, and that's really powerful. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like there's, um, you know, you're not alone out there. I feel like the tide is shifting very powerfully in many ways. So um, I think a friend of mine, Pedro Gonzalez, he he just had kind of like an attack from the establishment, uh, you know, kind of cent- centrist establishment against him trying to kind of gatekeep and say, okay, this is, this is the limit of, of what is nice to be said in the intellectual dark web, you know, by, by the uh, approved... Um, um, heterodox thinkers, uh, and it didn't it didn't work at all. It backfired, and you know, like they they brought out the big guns. They brought in Douglas Murray to to pen this uh, this attack, uh, and it didn't work. Like the, the old methods are not working. Um, people saw right through it. And, you know, this whole, um, you know, find the, find the racist or find the anti-Semite, find this, this stuff is getting old. And I feel a lot more people have noticed this than, than is comfortable for a lot of people in the establishment. Totally true. You know, I think like 10 years ago, um, a Republican politician would just be so terrified of being called a racist, like Mitt Romney when he ran for president against Obama, right? He was Mr. Nice Guy, and he was terrified of being called a racist. Well, he's not. He's not. A, Mitt Romney's not a racist. You know, you're not a racist. I'm not a racist. This is obviously true. But there was something so powerful about that then. It, it, it felt like it really, just the threat, right? The scepter of being called a racist. It loomed over people. Well, um, credit the left for going so far so fast and being so crazy and having no self-discipline. Now it's just clear they will call you a racist no matter what. That's just all they have. You know, they try to they try to just divide people based on all these immutable characteristics like that is their program. And if you oppose that, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a sexist, whatever. And so if you just like embrace that, which I find easy to do because I'm not those things like, you know, who who gives a shit what they say? 
It's just so obviously untrue. But as soon as they say it and the smoke clears, great. They've used their shot. It's bullshit. Now we can have a real conversation. And I do. I think that's where 60 or 70 percent of Americans are. Um, it's not this magic word that the left can use to control us anymore. Exactly. And they, we're just not going to do that. And there's no going back to a world in which they can do that. And it's not the only framework to to view reality from. It's not the only vantage point. I feel like that's that's where also establishment GOP is stuck in to, you know, like the Dinesh D'Souza card where he's just, you know, spends 10 years uh, showing you how Democrats are the, are the real racists and, and things like that. I think that's, you know, that's one angle, obviously, to find the real racist, but it's very hard to you know, out, out racist, the people who, you know, invented the microaggression or <laughs> invented, you know, misspelling someone's name <laughs> to be something, you know, like career ending. So, um, right. that's not a winnable game. So I think, um, I think one of the, the shifts that's happening now on the right is that people are starting to think a bit more broadly. They're going to they're starting to think a bit more, okay, like what should, what should the day to day of a, a healthy person look like? They're thinking about, you know, bodily health, the health of communities, the health of families, you know, people having children. There's so many issues that, you know, have decayed with, um, you know, kind of the, the leftward shift of society that now have to be kind of rebuilt from the ground up. So the, the whole substructure of society needs help. Um, and I'm really happy to see that people, you know, instead of just dunking on, on wokeness every day, they're starting to look at that and they're starting to rebuild that. And I've seen that, that that is, uh, you know, a big part of your platform as well. Um, and one of your kind of taglines is, you know, the, the, um, kind of surviving and also thriving on one, one income, um, which is yep. very novel, very sexist, obviously <laughs> this is insane. because obviously you're referring to, to, to women who have to stay home and do all the, the terrible chores and be chained to their husband. Like how do, how do you envision this, this, this functioning? Well, I do think there will be different models for it based on individual families, right? Um, I never said that I wanted women to stay at home and men to go work. That was what the left, right, hits me with. As soon as I say in America, you should be able to get by. You don't have to, like, have two incomes if you want. But, like, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we had an economy where you could be prosperous enough uh, as sort of an average American to, to get by? Uh, and raise a family on one single income. And of course, just like what we were talking about, that's true, but it's an elephant in the room. I think it's awkward and uncomfortable to talk about it. Yeah, there's a gendered aspect. We'll talk about that in a second. But also it's just, um, I think people recoil against it almost as a cope because it's really sad. We used to be able to do that in America and you know, 30, 40 years ago and something happened you know, globalization happened, inflation happened, just the increasing bureaucratic creep. Um, but even just chalking up the globalization, it's like, now you can't do it anymore. And that sucks. And I think it's hard. It's a hard pill to, to swallow. And so it's both pessimistic to mention this because you, you remember the, you know, the past that we used to have in the future that was sort of taken away from us. Um, but it's also optimistic, you know, because here I am, I'm a candidate, uh, I'm, I'm saying that like this is the benchmark that we're going to use to judge a healthy economy, not just GDP, not just abstract markers, but like can a family get by on one single income? And yes, it, yes, we can. And here's how we get there. Right. And I have policies that I think get us uh, get us there. Um, but it is fascinating how yeah the left just came at me with accusations of sexism. And I said, like, maybe the you know wife wants to go to work and the husband wants to stay at home. Like some families will choose that, right? Maybe it's, uh, you know, in the U.S., gay marriage is legal. Maybe two husbands or whatever want to go to work. Maybe there's a lot of single parent households and that's, you know, uh, sad, but like God bless the, the single parents that are in that situation and making it work. But are we going to try to make it arbitrarily harder for a single mother to get by, you know, if she happens to find herself in that situation? No, obviously she should be able to get by on one single income. Where I think it gets interesting, though, is it's true that if you just let people choose, if you had a prosperous enough economy where you could raise a family on one income and you let people choose, it wouldn't be this, you know, equal distribution. Like more women than men would choose to stay home and more men would go choose to to be out in the workforce. Um, and the left can't stand that. They can't stand the fact that you would get unequal outcomes, unequal in that sense. 
um, by letting people choose freely. Yeah, that seems to be. And I, I think they just they, they just have to engineer that out of existence, right? They couldn't possibly. And it's this fake concept that, yeah, you know, they, they, and that's why they need to propagandize that, you know, if you're at home, you are a slave to your children or a slave to your husband. And another real noble thing is to get out and have a boss, of course, who it does it's most people actually don't find like the supreme meaning in life uh, at their nine to five job. But but that's that talk about the elephant in the room. That's the elephant in the room. The left can't stand that a whole lot of women on the margin would prefer to stay home and raise families and sort of, you know, do that traditional gender role. I don't want to force that on anyone. Truly don't. But like people would choose that in greater quantities than choose it today if they weren't propagandized to get out in the workforce because you need to be just as equal to men uh, or if, or if they had the economic option to not have to work. Yeah. It's interesting that they're, they're able to, to mine kind of statistical resentment at that level, because uh, the, the things that they whip out always are, you know, the, the gender pay gap, which is this weird statistical fiction that, you know, if you control for a lot of factors, it disappears to, to like a, a, a slither. So it's, um, it's, it's really interesting. And it's also a very, uh, very class-based thing, isn't it? So th- these are the grievances of a uh, very high status people, you know, like you you hear a lot about um, uh, student loans, you know, student loans that, you know, go up in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, those are, those are p- typically racked up by, by people who are, you know, either middle class or, or kind of in, in that area. This, these, these are reforms that typically don't affect, um, you know, the, the people who actually you know, would need redistribution or would, would benefit more, mostly from that. So, um, you know, the left knows it's, um, it's target market and it's, it's not your every man. No, it's, it's essentially just, you know, people who really resonate with, uh, with the, uh, with the, the core message, uh, which, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's not for the, for the woman who would choose to, to stay home or, you know, that that's just a completely different, um, state of mind. Than, than the core. Yeah, I mean, mostly they're going for for uh, women with one or two college degrees, right? But, I mean, the AOCs, right? And she plays up having been a bartender and, and all that. But I think, where'd she go? I forget where she went. She went to a good school, but not great school. Brown, maybe. And then is just obsessed with student loan debt. Um, and I think there's a problem with student loan debt, but you don't fix it just by forgiving it. And that's, that's this huge, you know, F you to all the working class people who are either unable to, or also wise enough to avoid the college debt in the first place. Right. But it's, um, it's this narrow class of, of women who have college degrees and it takes the four years of propaganda to convince them, like, don't have a family, you know, your highest fulfillment will be going and putting this degree to work in the marketplace. And, um, and even then I think a lot peel off and you wind up having, having children and like, surprise, surprise, women want children, women want families and children. So do men, right? (laughs) This is like a, a healthy thing and it's how society perpetuates. But like, we tell people, no, like, don't do that career first, have kids later, you know, be skeptical of marriage and just the whole dating app thing. Like it's really dystopian out there, but, but people are still finding their way back to the, to the meaning and the structures that they know make more sense. Um, We're just making it really, really hard for them. And so, yeah, I don't think AOC has much to say to the American working class. She couches all her language in those terms, but actually she's speaking to like, you know, 36 year old millennials with no children and resentment because, yeah, I mean, they were lied to, but they also made the wrong choices for the last 15 years. Yeah, there's a lot of... um cognitive dissonance that you see in that, in that group of people. Like there's, it's very hard to walk back that lifestyle after a while, especially as a woman. Um, if you've invested your best years in, in pursuing, you know, the girl boss dream. Uh, and I know a lot of people criticize the idea that not, not every woman is a girl boss. Yeah, of course not every woman is a girl boss, but most of the women who are represented in media, um, who are powerful and, you know, propagate this messaging, they are girl bosses. And they tell you that this is the lifestyle that's, um, that's aspirational. And, and I wouldn't say this if I didn't know that, you know, people that I grew up with here in, you know, Hicksville, Romania, this is, you know, this is very much the edge of the, the American empire, but still, still part of it. They are absorbed by this, by this idea, by these essentially demons flowing in through their, their phones and the Instagram app. This is the, this is the aspirational lifestyle. 
complete autonomy, um, you know, make as much money as you can, you know, spend it on products, uh, on trips, on experiences, you know, that's another side. Experiences, sign-up. that's right. Exactly. So they think the they're being so worldly. Not products, not products. No, no, no. You wouldn't want to participate in like, you know, industrial capitalism or something. Experiences, you know, as if travel hasn't just become this um, fake nicely packaged product but yeah exactly and even even people who are like um you know minimalists or trying to reduce their consumption for you know eco reasons i see them and they're still buying all these eco eco crap like it's just another you know you're you're just been being funneled into an, another area of consumption you know you might consume less of the old school you know garish uh less um less sophisticated products but now you're buying bamboo toothbrushes and and, and all that other stuff so um yeah the the thing is i, I think the people who are, who are um, migrating back to trad, you know, more more normal lifestyles. You know, they call it trad now because it's like it has to have a flavor, it has to have a label. Yeah. But it's just being normal, you know, wanting children, wanting a family. Uh, so it's those people kind of they've gone through the um, through the process. At least that that's been my case. I've I've worked in you know kind of the, the Silicon Valley offshoot, the the island that we have in London. And I've worked for a few platforms like startups and, and bigger platforms. Uh, and I've done the career track, and I've seen you know I've kind of looked the head kind of um modeled my life through through the career track and i thought yeah this this is this not going to end well for me so you know let's put a halt to this now um and then i've i've you know i've become trad uh, but i think a lot of people either can't see that far or they maybe you know are not that self-aware or 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 are mesmerized by the narratives around them because there's always more status there always there's always more interesting stuff to to be and to consume and to be part of um in in that main narrative you know all of these other narratives are are i don't know they're just not as interesting um and for example, if, if you're the kind of person who wants, wants to have children, even if you're, you know, in a big city, uh, what that means is that you're going to have to cancel your life. You, you're not going to be able to hang out with the same people, you know, be part of the work family. Uh, you're not going to be working as much. It's just impossible to, you know, work the the 12 hour days that, you know, a, you know, a good growing startup requires of you. Um, and you're just going to be, you're exiling yourself from, from this life that you've built and invested probably a lot of your psychic energy into. So it's, I think that's, that's a big, a big problem for a lot of people that I know that, you know, it's just very hard to, to wrest yourself out of the grip of this story of your life where you're the, the architect, you know, the, the designer of, of, of an existence. It really is hard. Uh, and I, I sympathize. Like, I, I know why it's hard, you know, and it's it's because, I mean, it's just liberalism, right? And that's what we're living under. It's in the water, so to speak, you know. Um, when you're in, a, I think it's a bubble, like, it, you know, who knows how long the pendulum is and, and you know, do we get our reset moment here sort of electorally in 22 and 24? Or is this thing going to go for decades? And But it can't last forever because it doesn't work. And when you're in a bubble... Um, it's really hard to know you're in a bubble, you know, this is almost Truman show stuff. And, uh, and yeah, to me, I mean, it's just so clear when you put it well, but liberalism is just about rejecting and rebelling against all the unchosen bonds that you might have. Anything, anything traditional is, is suspect, right? It's this perennially revolutionary mindset. Um, but unlike, you know, Lenin who, okay, bad murderer. Okay. But there was some intentionality. There was some competence. There was a, there was a program, right? This is just, uh, I mean, in zero to one, we'd call it indefinite optimism, right? It's like, there's no program. It's just, it's just shut your eyes to reality and it's me, me, me. And yeah, I'm the architect of my own life would be, (laughs) would be like the little capsule version of it. But, but people are just throwing away every, uh, every obligation, every sense of responsibility, every opportunity to actually have new responsibility, right? Be responsible for something. Um, and that's all, that's all going down the, the drain. I mean, you see it right there in the birth rate here in America. It's just people don't want to be responsible for children or the next generation. They're barely responsible for their own lives in any sort of real sense. And we suffer for it. But I'm sympathetic because every single cultural program uh, tells people that that is good and the opposite is bad. 
And, you know, I feel like we're living in a crazy world and things are just upside down. Um, but I'm optimistic that, that we can break through with sort of healthier, healthier messaging and acknowledgement of reality, because ultimately you can't escape reality. Like it's, it stays real no matter what's going on up here, you know? Yeah. What, what can't go on won't go on. And I think that's, you know, that's the, the best kind of s substrate that your campaign's built on, you know, just right. you know, noticing, noticing hard. <laughs> um, noticing. Yeah. Which they want to make illegal, right? They want to make it, but, but again, I like our chances here because people are pretty commonsensical and pretty reality based if we can just break the spell. Exactly. And, um, I think one of the, you know, the, the, the big parts of this spell is, um, is kind of the, the nature of technology and kind of the, even, even broader than that, you know, the, the combination of, you know, uh, Nick Land calls this a techno capital. It's, you know, the, the, the capital power technology and technology powered capital, um, in the direction of just this constant improvement is almost has a life of its own. Um, and, you know, people talk about the algorithm on a tech platform, like even, even the distribution of money globally and, you know, how that works is, is, has a life of its own. There's a, there's essentially just, you know, I, I used to work for a big, um, a big tech platform and, the whole company was just one big AB test. That was, everything was draw, driven towards the AB test, you know, just the button colors, copy, everything was, that was what we were doing. Everyone was feeding into that. Uh, and that was how we made our money. And I've noticed working in, in the field that that's essentially how everyone makes their money. Uh, and this is just a, a small example of that. But, um, you know, the whole thing is, is, kind of driven into the direction of limbic capitalism. I think that Helen Andrews had this idea where, you know, things are created to to tickle your limbic system, which is not your neocortex. It's a bit deeper down. And there are, there are these phenomena that are just communicating with you on, on, on a different level. Um, and in no, you know, uncertain terms enslave you. And the, the more likely you are to be enslaved, the more likely they are to enslave you. Um, and I mean, you come from this world, you know, you've, you've dealt with, uh, with a lot of people, you know, Facebook is a big, a uh, big uh, creator of limbic capitalism. You know, these people, I mean, is there a way to, to manage these forces, uh, even in private, or is there a way to politically corral them? I mean, this is obviously a huge question, but, uh, this is something I think about every day. Like even in my interaction with technology, it's, it's a, uh, it's a hard thing. Like these are, these are, these products are made to, um, to make you pay in one way or another. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating set of questions. I do think that it's possible to corral them politically. I think we need to, um, I'll sort of give you my my views on that in a second, but I will preface it by saying, like, I don't think we can fully corral them. Like, I think the world, I think the world would be better off if Facebook and Twitter didn't exist, if hyper network sort of uh, information sharing like that didn't exist, at least in real time, right? I think there's some good things about Facebook. You know, you can catch up with the grandkids when you live a thousand miles away. Although it's like, why do you live a thousand miles away? Like, <laughs> live right next door to them, right? That's lifestyle design, but, but okay, not everyone can do that. So, so there's obviously some benefits of, of Facebook, but, um, but people sort of know that the costs are really quite deep and you're not going to be able to corral all of those. And, um, like, I don't think we can just make Facebook illegal and shut it down. Um, but I think that would probably in some sense be like the socially optimal thing. So I'm looking, you know, when I get in the Senate, it's like, I do think we need to meaningfully restrain big tech. And I'd focus sort of first on censorship. Like, it's crazy that they banned President Trump uh, from the platform while he was president, right? Or Marjorie Taylor Greene. And, uh, you know, they, they trot out experts and data that shows that allegedly there's no sort of partisan slant to the discrimination. But that's, that's just not what I see. Like, I, I think they, they do it for political reasons and that should be banned, right? We should treat them like common carriers and literally make it illegal with hefty fines if they are discriminating against uh, basically anybody um, for their political views. And I think you can do that to a big company without risking sort of over-regulating business. It's like if you're a genuine, huge 50 million user plus communications utility, you are a free speech platform, period. Uh Election interference, I worry a lot about what Google and Facebook, we know Facebook does it, right? They ripped the Hunter Biden laptop story off the internet. I think that one act of corporate censorship, like that swings hundreds of thousands, if not a million votes. And that's the election right there. Um, 
to say nothing of all the other funny stuff that that probably happened, but like that's election interference. Why is Facebook allowed to do that, right? And then Google, of course, can subtly do it. And that's even more dangerous because we don't see if Google is changing their algorithm. So I'd focus on those things, but like, I do think we need to focus on the addiction problem. I think big tech, like they know what they're doing, right? I mean, you know how it works. They employ psychologists to try to, to inform these algorithms and make the, make the, the stuff as addictive as possible. And all these people who I know in Silicon Valley, like who build these products, they don't let their own kids play with them. You know, they're not going to give their three-year-old son an iPad and just like off to the races, you know, and I don't do that for my own children. Um, but they do that intentionally and they know in some sense they're inflicting that scourge on middle America. You know, it starts to look a lot like tobacco, which maybe we overregulated when we figured out there was a problem, but at least we did something. Um, gambling, you know, we, we recognize it as some kind of vice requiring of regulation and guardrails, but right now it's just complete lazy affair with big tech. And I worry a lot about like how much time are children spending on this stuff? What does the infinite scroll and Instagram do to a, a teenager's brain, you know, especially teenage women. And I think Facebook even has the internal studies on this, right? Like at least they did internal studies, but still it shows that like this stuff makes people depressed and in many cases suicidal. And they keep it going and, you know, they say they don't serve targeted advertising to children, but I'm pretty sure they do. And I think that's that's really messed up. But here's the frustrating thing. Even if you made them common carriers and, you know, you you basically found a way to make sure that they weren't influencing elections and you tightened up sort of uh, how they were able to interact with and advertise to children, you still have these platforms. You still have them feels really hard to go back to, to the pre-networked world. Um, and there would be costs associated with that. You'd lose the benefits, but, but it almost just feels impossible. And so you get these flash mobs, you know, something happens, there's police video cam in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And then all of a sudden London is like burning down <laughs> because people are rioting. Right. And I don't, I mean, definitely from an evolutionary bio perspective, like our brains are not made to, to understand and take in information in real time from thousands of miles away and channel that into some partisan mob reaction. And so I, I worry a lot about that and I'm frankly just not sure what to do with it, but it seems, it seems very fair and plausible to suggest that the whole effect of it all is net negative and we would be better off about it. Yeah. I've, I've come to, you know, slowly agree with this point as well. I mean, I've, I've, you know, this podcast wouldn't work if I wasn't on, on Twitter, if I didn't kind of create a platform there. Um, you know, there's a lot of upside to it, but I think on the whole, it's probably, um, just a, a conduit for, for demonic possession to a, to a scale that, you know, never be seen, never seen before. Um, well, well said, <laughs> but it, like it also exists, right? Yeah, it, it exists. And I think we need to meaningfully restrain the companies in the ways I outlined, but it exists. And so it's almost pointless to complain about it. It's like there's a lot of developments in modernity that we can, oh, you know, woe is me. But here we are. So the question is, like, what do we do about it? Um, can we what's the what's the wise course and how do we how do we live with it? Because I, I, I don't think it's don't think it's going away. Yeah, and we can, we kind of have to see today as as you know year zero and 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 build from there because yeah this is a, an extreme change in how people um, see each other and see themselves. I mean, I've um, I listened to a podcast recently. I don't remember the the researcher's name, but he had this concept of of profilicity as being the um, the uh, kind of the, the combination of, of, you know, kind of fractal identities that people use to, to relate to themselves nowadays. So essentially you kind of create yourself by presenting yourself, you know, it's that, that idea that, you know, if it's not online, you know, Pixar didn't happen. Um, you know, there's this kind of this, this idea that, you know, you can have these experiences and, um, you know, you add to your, um, portfolio of, of personality, you kind of create a profile for yourself. Um, and it's not, idiotic to do so because I, you know, you hear a lot of people are oh, so vain to post selfies on the internet, but if you do not post selfies, you know, the, 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 your 
profile on the internet is extremely important, especially like you said, for teenage girls, you know, without the profile on the internet, who are you? That is the the center of socialization. And it is logical and, and sane in a way to try to curate that, that profile and to be that type of person who, you know, looks like they don't put any effort into their selfie, but they've taken 117 and picked out the perfect one that looks just candid enough. And, you know, it's, it, it makes sense. And, um, you know, this, this researcher was studying this at, you know, the level of, of larger cohorts. And um, he said that, you know, this is what a well-adjusted person does nowadays, because this is how people interact. And it, it, it is a bit, it is a bit scary because we're, we're already at this point. So this is essentially where we take it from. Whatever changes we have, I don't think there's a return button on this one. So, you know, this is unhealthy for a lot of people, but this is also how healthy people engage with each other. So I I don't know you know what what to make of that you know <laughs> it's a bad it's a bad it's a bad combination it's a bad spot on the two by two matrix where it's like yeah society is crazy and fake and doesn't make any sense but it is uh, at least thinly rational for you to participate in that in that structure this is how I feel about college right like I'm super super critical of college and higher education and and you know it's become a racket and we could spend all day talking about it but like unfortunately it um and look we're trying to pull people out of college and go to the teal fellowship and just do your own thing right i think if if you can escape you should but it probably is thinly rational for like a lot of smart you know talented people um who are able to to go in and game that system it probably does make sense to still go to stanford not if you have any delusion that you're going to get like well educated or something and not if you're going to saddle yourself with like a lifetime of debt that you can't pay back. But like, if you can go and, and, and get the paper, you know, that's still valuable social currency. And I wish it wasn't and <laughs> tried to sort of delegitimize it uh, through some of my work, but it still makes sense, which is why it continues. Right. Um, you're in this like emperor has no clothes moment, but before you get this mass sort of realization it's still thinly rational for each individual person not to, not to sort of shout the obvious truth and to, to play along and, and, and go and fit in. And that's something really weird about that. Cause like you said, it's unhealthy, but it's like actually maybe the healthiest choice for each individual in, individual person not to rock the boat. But that just feels like a house of cards and I don't know when it breaks, but one gets the sense that, um, the illusion will be quite painful when it, when it goes away and more so if we invest more into it. And so like the sooner, the better that people can kind of recognize reality and get away from the vain selfie thing or get away from this idea of this delusion, really, that everybody has to go to college, the better. If we invest 10 or 20 more years in these crazy fictions, won't it just be all the more painful when they, when they crumble? Yeah. And it does feel like, you know, everybody's kind of optimizing for their own, for their own benefit. And it does seem that, you know, it's, it's rational on, on one level. Um, but you know, people respond to incentives and I feel like that's kind of the blind spot for a lot of kind of this autonomy worship that's at the core of liberalism is that, okay, if you optimize for yourself, that is kind of a limited game because as an individual, you're entangled in, in, you know, cooperative games with everyone else. But if you keep optimizing for yourself and yourself and yourself and yourself, those cooperative games eventually fall away because you're, you know, you're pre- playing prisoner's dilemma and you're, de- you're, you're uh, defecting every time and everyone does the same in all sorts of games. You know, you have dating, trying to find a spouse. Well, if you're in a, in a place where, you know, at best you can maybe get like a series of serial monogamy and, you know, no one really wants to settle down because they're keeping their options open. And, you know, even if you are the kind of person who is really traditional and really wants to get married, who are you going to marry? <laughs> like no one's going to marry you. So it's, you know, the, and any sort of option that's not completely autonomy focused falls away in an autonomy focused system. And yeah, this is, this is probably going to crumble eventually. I don't see it going very, very well for, for the long term. But yeah, what on the margin can we do to guide that in a healthier direction? Yeah. Open question. Like I have some theories and I'm, I'm running for office because I think that's one interesting vertical, you know, if like, if you just focus on the tech thing, right? Like there's two, I guess there's three scenarios. One, no one's going to change or have any meaningful control over uh, our technological future. It's just a a random walk or whatever outside of any individual's purview. And so you don't have to do anything like whatever. What's going to happen is going to happen. And it's probably going to be dystopian. Uh, Two is you could try to restrain it politically, 
which is what I'm trying to do. Um, it's where I think my relative talents and, and interests lie. You know, I think I can win this Senate election and I'll do that and I'll find out how much one person can do. Um, I mean, you already have like Josh Hawley in the Senate, who I think is pretty good on big tech and stuff like that. So we'll find out how much we can do uh, legislatively. Although we're not naive. We know it's like Congress is kind of a disaster right now, of course. Uh, but option three is just um, technological. Like, can you actually steer this stuff? Right. And that's why I'm actually, I don't, I don't know if I'm like optimistic, but I certainly, uh, I wish the web three stuff well and decentralization and crypto. Right. And like, we, I think have learned a lot of, um, we've learned a lot about web two and the centralization and, you know, it was supposed to liberate everybody. And actually we're all just part of the Facebook complex. Um, and it's inescapable, right? And it's inescapable because they buy all these companies and they're buying WhatsApp and Instagram and all these ones you've never heard of to make sure that there's no competition. It's really just this centralization and it doesn't work well. It is, it is a choke point. It's a vulnerability. And so maybe there are technological ways um, around it. I think Facebook's going to be with us for a long time, but perhaps not forever. And maybe the the thing that eclipses it is is something that's truly decentralized, but has nothing to do with... Uh, with politics. So I'm not sure I'm investing in the political bucket. Cause I think that's where I can make a change. I know a lot of smart people, people smarter than me are doing the web three decentralization stuff. And I hope that one of those two work because the scenario where it's just like, Nope, you know, this is going to have a life force of its own. I think you get to a point where like technology really can enslave people, certainly metaphorically and certainly psychologically, but like ultimately maybe literally. Right. And Maybe we're only a couple of decades away from that. Yeah, and that's the the kind of the the, the Tyler Cowen uh, idea of these uh, kind of pod cities where all the all the, the non intelligentsia live connected to their uh, <laughs> masturbatory machines, and you know it's a uh, it's a cheap way to have to, yeah. to warehouse them. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's one way one, one form of slavery that's not recognized as such, but but it is definitely. Or just like, you know, the intermediate case that, that, you know, some of our friends on the internet likes to talk about is living in the pod and eating the bugs and, you know, just more of a, just halfway between where we are now, but dial up Uber Eats and Netflix and boutique strains of marijuana getting delivered to your door and they'll, they'll keep everyone docile and under control. And uh, I, I, I think that's bad. I think most people think that's bad, but I don't think most people feel like they have any agency in um, helping create a world where that's not the case in 10 or 12 years. Um, have you always had kind of this political leaning? Because I know that Silicon Valley typically is mostly libertarian or at least used to be mostly libertarian, but, you know, things have changed a little bit recently and there's, there's a based core surrounded by, you know, kind of, you know, a, a hyper driven wokeness and, and, and Silicon Valley. So it's a land of contrasts. Um, yeah. But yeah. Have you, have you had big shifts in, in your political orientation? I've definitely had shifts and definitely evolved, but um, what I've always been is anti-progressive. Like always, as long as I can remember, it was just like the, the far left is is crazy. And I mean, there are some like far left thinkers that I think are interesting, but like the far left in terms of like, you know, political socialism or here in the U.S., you know, our, our progressives, I always knew that was bad news. Um and so I've always been been a man of the right in that sense. But, you know, I did the Ayn Rand thing and then became very libertarian in high school, college, Milton Friedman, Austrian school, Murray Rothbard. And I think that foundation is super important. Um, I'm glad I have it. I no longer sort of identify as a libertarian, but um, but I'm sympathetic. Like the libertarian thing is still sort of in my in my DNA and I want people to be free. I really do. I think individual freedom is is huge. It's not the only thing you need, right? I, I, I don't want to take it so far as to succumb to this liberal idea that like your family doesn't matter because you're just an individual or something. But, but most libertarians actually don't, or most sort of uh, folk libertarians actually don't, right? And, and this is where as you get a little bit older, certainly I mean, um, I became more conservative. It's like libertarianism, you know, one cur a rough cut could be it's correct in theory and then in practice, no, the progressives will just own you. If you're not using any political power to shore up, 
you know, a good society that follows the rule of law and actually respects the individual liberties that you care about, you will just get, you'll get rolled, you know, it's like a pacifist and okay, you can recite an eloquent poem about pacifism right before they line you up against the wall and shoot you. Right. Um, and so that is the fundamental problem with political power is like, how do you use it in a way that, that is limited and, and doesn't become totalitarian itself. Right. Uh, and so I feel like I've had this interesting evolution where I can understand the libertarian thing. And of course, like there's a lot of libertarianism, small L in the American political tradition. And it's very important, but I do think we're at a moment where no, we need a new generation of leaders that are going to come in and be willing, um, to use political power and use it wisely and judiciously. But, but we, we need someone with their hand on the tiller who understands where we've been and where we need to go. And uh, otherwise we will get just totally owned by the, the progressive left. And I think the progressive left just remains the enemy. It's the enemy of, of true progress. It's the enemy of everything that is good. I've seen um, a lot of people who have actual experience with, with business and, and what in the market actually looks like become much more nuanced in their, in their relationship to, to libertarianism. I feel like a lot of people who don't really exactly know how business works uh, and maybe have, you know, went to the DMV and saw, you know, the, <laughs> this complete disaster there, think, okay, yeah, government shouldn't be in charge of anything. Uh, the market can regulate itself because, you know, it's, it's great to have many products and all that. And that was also my thinking. Uh, but once you get into the belly of the beast, you see what the market is like at scale it is not so different from the state and it is also not disentangled from the state. Like an entity like, like Amazon or Google or things like that, you know, is in many ways an arm of the state and maybe not even the state, but of the ruling class of the regime that, you know, is kind of all encompassing. So um, I think that's where a lot of nuance comes in where people say, okay, yeah, you know, to be for freedom at an individual level, you have to be against these things. And just being pro corporations is, doesn't mean necessarily that these corporations will, um, you know, think because you let them be free that they're going to let you be free because they have right. insane amounts of power. Right. Yeah. I mean, the state really, you know, defines the contours of the market. Where are they going to step in and enforce property rights? Are they are they uh, actively intervening? And of course, it always is. It always is. We've had a, a, a mixed sort of non-free market system for a, a long time. And um, yeah, I mean, I agree, to, agree with you that like Amazon is only a private company in some sense, right? Facebook is only a private company in some sense. And in another sense, like Facebook is literally an extension of the, the Biden White House. You know, like they talk and Jen Psaki says, take that and that and that post down because that's COVID misinformation. And then they hang the antitrust hammer over Facebook and Facebook doesn't want that. And so they comply. Right. And that's this fusion of, of state and corporate power. Maybe it's not quite appropriately called fascism or that feels somehow wrong, but, but it's bad. It's, it's definitely bad and it has nothing to do with the free market. Right. And so, no, I think it's worth being anti-corporation in that sense. Uh, the mistake would be to be like completely anti-corporation, you know, and extend that skepticism to like small and medium business or, or yeah, you know, I didn't mean, I don't even care about big business if it's actually behaving like, and I think you can, it's harder to do this now because everything is part of this regime. Everything does kind of become part of the Borg, but you know, you could imagine fifties and sixties, it was like, what was good for general motors was good for America. And general motors wasn't sort of super tied into the government. And if you had big business as an institution in society, Maybe that was even positive because it was a check on the government. You know, you want a strong church, you want strong civil society, you want big business. And, and then you, you know, you want your government to be small, but minimally competent or competent at what its uh, minimal functions are. And, and now I think the problem with big business is this fusion, right? It's not quite business. It's not quite government. It is the apparatus that rules over you. I don't care if like Caterpillar, you know, the, the tractor manufacturer, I don't know what their market cap is, but I don't care if they merge with another company, another tractor company, and that's a hundred billion dollar merger, say, like, that's fine. As long as they're not, uh, you know, we have antitrust framework to deal with this, as long as they're not going to like jack up the prices and like mess it up. I don't mind that kind of consolidation or that success at that scale. But when you get to things like pharma 
when you get to things like network monopolies that are controlling the flow of information in our society, um, I think they're just so much more tangled in with the government and the the ruling apparatus, the regime, or whatever you want to call it, that that we have to look at those from a different regulatory lens. Otherwise, again, we just get owned. And so it's complicated to unpack all this stuff. But that's why I do think it's like important to approach it from a pro-business, pro-market perspective. Because I think if you just get the hammer out and start smashing companies, like, you know, things really, things really will break in, in bad and painful ways. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that at all. But we also just can't be like laissez-faire. It's all capitalism. Whatever happens, it's all capitalism, you know. And then you look like an ostrich burying your head in the sand, like unwilling to pay attention to the consequences. And the consequences are immense, you know. The consequences are in five or ten years, we'll be in the pods eating cricket meal or whatever. <laughs> and that's bad for everybody. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are blind to the fact that, you know, if you have a laissez-faire economics, you know, the, the state grows in parallel with that because, um, you know, the, the market makes certain demands on the population. Like, for example, you know, you move where the jobs are, um, you know, that kind of displaces people that kind of creates these areas that are economically deprived or no one, no one necessarily needs to create jobs in those areas. So the people remaining there are going to be, um, you know, in poverty, there's going to be so, all sorts of, you know, social decay, um, you know, laissez-faire, whatever you should, you should move, you know, that would be like the libertarian response to that, you know, go where the jobs right. are. Um, I mean, if the jobs are, you know, in, in mainland Taiwan, <laughs> I don't know if you, right. if you, yeah. If Bangladesh, you, yeah. Exactly. That's, that's where, you know, the shoe manufacturer is moving, you know, what are you doing? So, um, I, you know, and essentially the state has to step in to provide services and you know, to increase welfare to, you know, essentially, yeah, take over the protection of this underclass of people who have fallen through the cracks because they're not, they can't be productive anymore competing with whatever big, big business wants to do to, to optimize costs. So, um, it, it feels like, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of themes coming up in, in the this area. And I know there's one important conversation happening in Silicon Valley kind of related to this. It's the, uh, it's immigration, you know, Silicon Valley's typically been very pro immigration, you know, H1B visas has, have been a big, a big topic where, there as well. I mean, what, what's, what's your position? What would be a sensible immigration regime, um, for the United States that would protect business, but also, yeah, mitigate all the, I mean, some of the problems. Yep. I mean, I think, um, Illegal immigration, you know, we shove zero. That's that's easy. Uh, amazingly, people still disagree with that, but that one seems pretty obvious to me. And then, okay, now we're talking about legal immigration. And by the way, it's just too easy for political conservatives to say, like, illegal is bad, legal is good. Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot. You know, it's like that, I guess that's six words. Legal is good, illegal is bad, and it's lazy. Because it's like, well, how much legal immigration should we have? Should it be 20 million people a year in a nation of 330 million? Like, that seems high. That's not what we have now. But we do have more than a million legal immigrants every year um, if you add up all the, all the visas and stuff like that. And I think that's way too much. I really do think that's too much. One gets the sense that it's not quite the right set of a million people either. Like, I do want the best and the brightest to come in every year. And, I mean, it might be a tough debate, but, but this is a debate that you would want Congress to have. Right. Like literally how many immigrants should we take this year? Uh, who should they be? Where should they come from? What skills should they have? And what's the argument for for why their presence in America is going to make make things better for Americans? Um, and that's the litmus test of any good immigration system. But right now, like just in the H-1B context, um, I think we take like 80,000 H-1B visas a year. And. I've come to see it as like corporate welfare for Google and Facebook at this point. Like, of course they would rather import tens of thousands of people from India to, to do these software programming jobs for less money than they would have to pay, you know, uh, a U.S. worker. And if you just develop this mentality, so I get it again, it's thinly rational from Zuckerberg's perspective. Like, of course he would want this. It's just better on the balance sheet. But it's, it's definitely worse for the country. And this is where it is up to policymakers. It is up to Congress, right? And the president to, uh, to provide the guardrails. To me, it's like parenting almost. Like I can blame big tech and I absolutely do, but they're like children that are going to behave in all sorts of different ways, testing the limits. 
And if you don't discipline your child, you know, and do it firmly and with love, not in an out of control way. But if you don't like set the limits, then they're not going to stay within the limits. Then there is no limit. And that kid is going to become a terror and a tyrant. Right. And if it's just complete laissez-faire, do whatever you want. Let's have, un, you know, and you see this push in the Congress right now. Uh, the left wants unlimited H-1B visas. They want unlimited caps uh, for for many classes of, of visa. And if you if you offer that up, it's like no shit businesses will take advantage of it. But maybe it just should be off the table because maybe businesses and, and you know, our own education system, maybe we are responsible for making sure that our own human capital, that our own people are developed and that we have the education and skills that are going to make people successful in in the workforce so that they can have a job in America so that they don't have to move to Bangladesh, right? Because countries are real. I, I guess I would start by saying we should probably take like 200,000 instead of a million and then really drill down on those 200,000 and like, who are they? Where do they come from? I suspect like the 01 sort of exceptional, talented, you know, best and the brightest visa. Maybe there's like 20 or 30,000 of those people we should take every year, but I don't think there's a million of them. And I can't in good conscience say we should take in a million new legal immigrants every year when so many already existing Americans are struggling um, from a lack of economic opportunity, right? From, from fentanyl, from homelessness. Why are we looking to, to import tons more people when we're not even doing a good job of uh, taking care of business at home? One one thing that uh, I feel sets you apart, and it's you know again part of the the, the noticing <laughs> thing, is the fact that um, you um, separate the the interests of, of of Americans of born Americans of American citizens from the interests of of the the wider world. That is not something that a, a nice person does nowadays. You know, uh, it's the idea that not everyone has a right to to immigrate or emigrate from from anywhere. I think that this is a very novel concept. And um, I remember when I was in London, I was discussing this with some 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 minor bureaucrats. And when I brought up the idea that you know the the ancestral peoples of the British Isles might have something to say about who comes in and out or who gets to stay or things like that. They looked at me, you know, with, with kindness and with, you know, the, the um, requisite generosity that you give to an immigrant who, you know, might not know what she's talking about. Uh, but uh, it was, it was very shocked. Like no one had ever brought up the idea to them that, you know, there, there might be some interests, there might be, you know, some privilege conferred by citizenship that I as an immigrant might not have. And I, I found that natural and normal, but they thought, did not. So they, they thought, you know, you know, I would, should, have and, and I'm entitled to absolutely every every right that a British citizen had. So I don't know. It's a it's a strange it's a strange mindset. <laughs> have Have you gotten any pushback on that? A lot. I mean, a tremendous amount. But again, this is this is the elephant, and uh, yeah, it can be dangerous to notice things, I guess. But um, but that's what I'm doing. I'm talking about this elephant, and it's both true and demonstrably true. And I think more than half of people and Americans agree with me but a very vocal minority, but still some plurality, uh, hates it. And so it's this powerful thing. And I think there's some things about the American context that, <clears throat> that make it uh, more of a strange conversation that, that, make, that make what I'm saying more controversial. But if you just look at like a different country, like Canada, Canada's got like a pretty restrictive immigration system and seems completely reasonable. It's like merit-based, it's point-based, it takes a long time to become a legal immigrant probably more efficient than ours in some sense, but it's not easy to immigrate to Canada legally. And then they don't have that much of an illegal immigration problem. Uh, if you s propose to a, to a Democrat, like, I think our immigration system should work like Canada's, they, it, it wouldn't really compute, right? Because they're sort of trained in a lazy way to think like, oh, Canada is more urbane and wise than the U.S. And no, that's actually a conservative immigration system, right? Um, I don't think that as an American, I have the right to go sneak into Germany and start demanding shit. Like what? I demand welfare and eventually German citizenship or the, the right to a German ballot. Like that's crazy. Obviously, like I can't go and become Chinese, but when I can't go and become Chinese, I mean like, yeah, I can never go and actually become a Chinese national but one reason for that is because like China is a, uh, a, a racial 
racist country, right? Like I'm not Han Chinese. And so I'm never going to be Chinese and, and still German to some extent. Right. I know they have like, you know, it's more diverse now and it's, it's more pluralistic, but it's still like you're German or you're not. And I'm never going to be German. And the U S is different, right? Like the U S truly has, um, this, this pluralistic concept of citizenship. And it's awesome. And it's this grand experiment. It doesn't mean everything is easy. In some, some cases, it makes things hard. Certainly, it, it uh, I think the left loves to, to sort of divide and conquer people, you know, based on race and ethnicity and all this stuff. So, so there's some vulnerabilities there. But, but no, it's this grand experiment where if you are an American citizen, it doesn't matter what your background is. And, and we truly are pluralistic. But it means it freaks the left out when you talk about the U.S. and Americans as a people. And I do like we're still a people. The fundamental driving unifying idea is not race, although it's true that most people in this country are white, but we're still a people, whether you're white or black or brown or whatever. If you're an American, you're an American. And like as an elected official, like that's who I will be looking out for. And just because people look different and people look different around the world doesn't mean that everybody has the right to be an American. And so that's this interesting question is, can we, can we keep the, the guardrails on? Can we still cohere as a people? And it's not just about believing in an idea. I think you have to believe in, in sort of the fundamental, you know, American ideas of, of freedom and, and, you know, equality under the law and all this stuff. But if you're a Bangladeshi and you believe in that and you read the U.S. Constitution, like, I'm glad you did that. Congratulations. But you're still not an American. Right. And we have to hold the line. And if you don't hold the line and it's either open borders, literally in an illegal immigration context or just like, hey, mass immigration for decades upon decades. You know, I think the Democrat dream would be in some sense to grant two billion people citizenship right now so that they could sort of shore up electoral power. But if we don't hold the line, then uh, this this experiment in sort of representative democracy, this republic. this pluralistic republic. It just it just scatters and so what is the common culture what is the common belief in the future that's going to like hold our people together but but i'm out there saying it we have a people it's like we are the american people and we are not the people of burkina faso or you know switzerland and it's a challenge because it's a big country it's more uh it, it is more diverse but like what's going to hold us together and it's not going to happen by accident and i think that's a really fascinating set of questions and I hear almost no elected officials talking about them. There, there seems to be an, an idea that, you know, all, all of this isn't important. It's all about kind of material, you know, what can the state do for you? And, uh, you know, everyone can have their own culture and live side by side. And the only relationship that matters is that between you and the state. And, you know, uh, if, if you're cared for by the state, that's, that's about it. And we can just live parallel lives. But um, unfortunately, that's, that's just not, that's just not feasible. Like I, I really don't see, and, and essentially, that's also a big part of why I moved out of the the, the UK. Um, it was just unsustainable to be so self hating. It's just consuming the, the 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 social capital so fast that I it just it just doesn't work. Yeah, and that's what I see on the left is a whole lot of self hating. Like I truly think that the left is ashamed of America, and it's not just that they you know, look at certain things in our past and say that wasn't good and we need to make sure that those are gone and make them better. They view it as um, as having invalidated the whole the whole project. It's like they don't believe in America. They don't want it to exist in any recognizable form. I think at the extremes, you know, political progressive uh, side of the spectrum, they don't believe in nations. They don't believe in countries. And, you know, because if you have a nation and you have a country, you have to decide who's a part of that and who's not. And, you know, one word for deciding is the nice word. Discriminate is the other word. You are discriminating against every citizen of Indonesia by not letting them become American. But it's like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to do because we are a nation. Right. And so it's the, it's the rule of law and they don't like that. And they, they would rather it, you know, be some international order. Cause again, if your relationship, if the only relationship that matters is between you as the, the liberated individual and the state, then it doesn't matter if you have a nation or if you just have, you know, if you're being ruled from Brussels by a bunch of bureaucrats, 
um, which in some sense would be technically, you know, technically more efficient, but like that's a dystopian hell world. And if you can actually shore up and have like meaningful countries that actually are different from one another, and that's true diversity, right? Celebrate that difference. Don't try to homogenize everything and make everything the same. Like I know what future is better. I know what one I prefer. I know what one Americans prefer, but somehow we're like sliding down this path where everything's internationalized and borders are porous and it's just globalization uh, writ large and left unchecked. I think that's going to be a disaster. Yeah, there's also a movement in kind of the same vein to um, to say that you know it takes a village to to raise a child. I keep hearing that from from a lot of people that you know the, the family is kind of the, uh, the the smallest tyranny, you know, the smallest unit of tyranny, the smallest unit of oppression, um, uh, the smallest place where you know children might not get the the proper instruction of being you know and an, the universal individual, and you know they're, they're not worldly enough. You you know, the parents are not worldly enough to, to teach the children. I mean, you have you have children um, and you've also been outspoken about the, the CRT debate. Um, I mean, how do you see see this playing out, especially, for example, if, if you know, CRT is now illegal, let's say in, in all state it, it is illegal. How would that be enforced? Because it feels to me like, you know, the people who, who are in the schools teaching, they they don't ex- even need a curriculum to tell them that CRT is what's on the menu. They're they're very much uh, immersed in, in that mindset, you know. So, you know, the, the teachers union has has a politics. Um, you know, how would how would that be, you know, how would a CRT be exercised or that or that right. idea? Well, know? I mean, I do think we need as much sort of decentralization and localization. Um, local control of of schools and education as possible. Um, It's, I mean, we got to crush the teachers unions. You know, I think this was true five years ago, but you couldn't say it five years ago because the teachers unions were still perceived to be sort of working, you know, in line with, with children's interests. But I think with the COVID experience, they've just jumped so far left. They've been so, so entitled, like it is transparently now anti-student. so, so crush the teachers unions as a political entity. I don't think you should be allowed to unionize against the taxpayers like that or the children. But, you know, local control. It's like I, I recoil when I hear the, I think it's Hillary Clinton, right? It takes a village. The ironic thing about that is if you actually had like small, you know, relatively empowered villages, towns, communities of interest, that would probably be like much better for children, Right a town that might actually have values and have a school that worked local control, parental insight over that, uh, that school and kids would get a good education and not get indoctrinated, but get brought up with the town's values and the family's values. Like that would be good. And I think the left would hate that. Like they don't really mean it takes a village. They don't want like, (laughs) they don't want America to be this array of, of really cool towns and villages with local character and flavor and, no, they want everything homogenized and centralized. When, when, when they say it takes a village, they mean like we want our top bureaucrats at the Department of Education to like run your shit and to like, you know, co-parent your kid. So I'm, yeah, that's my plug for villages. Down for, for cool <laughs> decentralized villages. Uh, but, but you are seeing this attack on the family and conservatives get made fun of every time we talk about it. But it's, it's, it's just true. Like left-wingers hate the family, uh, whether atomic or extended, because it's one of those unchosen bonds, right? And they're obsessed with teaching young people that everything their parents, you know, believe, everything their dad or granddad, you know, fought for in World War II is racist and retrograde and follow us to the path of enlightenment. And I think your point is wise that that is very decentralized at this point. We should ban critical race theory, but to pretend that those one or two page bills solve the problem when the problem is cultural uh, would be an error. And I think localities, municipalities need to take back their schools and basically like, you know, you probably promote the top 10% of teachers and you probably have to fire the bottom 30% like right away, the idiots and the ideologues. I think there's a lot of them. And you're not supposed to say that because you're supposed to pretend that every teacher is a hero. <laughs> but no, I think like there's some really good teachers. There's mediocre teachers and there's bad teachers. And it's the job of the teachers unions to homogenize that, to blur the lines, to pretend that everyone is the same. And they're not. 
But like you used to be able to, a hundred years ago, if you were in a one room schoolhouse in America, you were getting a better education than the average American student now, even though they had no money, maybe the floor was like literally dirt, but it was like serious people teaching serious pupils and you set the bar high and, you know, maybe you wouldn't do things the exact same, but like, damn it, like things should be working so much better. And our system is so piss poor right now that if we just had the political will, we could like reform it radically. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those, uh, you know, <laughs> there's no other way to put it. It's, it's a clusterfuck and it's the same, it's the same situation all over, all over the world. And, um, I mean, the decline in standards, the, you know, the, the kind of this, this idea that you kind of, you want to universalize, you know, expand in that direction, you know, it really has ruined the Romanian schools used to be much better during communism. I'm sorry to say it because there's, it's just, you know, a stricter standard, there was more local stuff and there was inter-regional competition. We had this thing called the Olympics. I was part of them. I mean, post-communism, but we still had like remnants of the communist system. And then you would just go excel in one thing. And I, went to like the National Biology Olympics and we all would nerd out on whatever biology and stuff that we were interested in. But it was just like a, a thing that was really motivational. But now I see uh, my niece, she goes to school now here and it's just, it's exactly, it's exactly like in the US. And that's why, you know, I'm interested in all this stuff. Um, you know, all the same, the same, um, you know, mimetic viruses stalk the land here as well. You know, they're trans kids in, you know, Hicksville, Romania, all this stuff. They were, there weren't any like two years ago, but now there are like, yeah. So it's, it's, it all comes through, um, I guess, I don't know, Instagram, TikTok, I have, it's just, I keep bringing up these anecdotes, but I know women obsessed, you know, like this, the same girl boss women, they have the same problems, the same ideas because they come, they, they're they piped in hot through all of these, these media channels. And uh, it's also high status to be interested in all this stuff. You know, it's very high status yeah. to, you know, think about Black Lives Matter and, you know, be interested in social justice and all this stuff. Um, and it's, it is nuts because there are no black people in Romania, like literally, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a percent. All the more reason to, to really just make that your, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really strange. So anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put a pin in that. <laughs> we might, we might continue that another time. I want to ask you as the last question, the question of the show, this is a question everyone gets on the show. Um, do you have a um, subversive thinker, you know, living or dead, could be a writer, could be even a business person uh, that you think people should um, look up, look into, know more about that's, you know, underrated and, and would, um, yeah, would influence people in a good direction subversive thinker that's underrated yeah uh i'll probably get in trouble for saying this no nah, i mean i i'd say how about like theodore kaczynski good good one <laughs> actually yeah uh, probably not great to be talking about the uh, unabomber while campaigning but um and look, I shouldn't have to say the obvious, right? Which is like, he's a terrorist. You shouldn't hurt people, obviously. Of course. But his book is pretty good. Well, I, well, yeah, I mean, and there's a lot that I disagree with, right? Like, this is not an endorsement, but like, there's a lot of insight there. There's a lot that is is correct. Like, um, again, I you heard me say 20 minutes ago, I don't think we can go back. You know, I think, I think his understanding is like, you know, what is it? Industrial society has been a disaster and... You know, he wants us to blow it all up and go back to, it's almost like David Graeber, like, or no, John Gray, I think. It's like, we'd all be better off if we were just like deer in the forest, right? Well, that's not what humanity is. And we build civilizations and, you know, I'm a, I'm a business guy. I'm a capitalist, I think. So I don't endorse all of it, but like some of the criticisms of industrial society. And I think he, you know, he wrote before the rise of modern social networking and, and hyper-networked connectivity. But I do think there's a lot about the stuff that's like degrading and debasing and yeah, uh, just fiber optic pipes, right? High bandwidth for the transmission of these mimetic uh, mind viruses, right? Like the first thing that came to mind was Gerard when you said that, but I don't think he's subversive enough. But you combine Gerard and Kaczynski with the sort of modern social networking and like, yikes, things are really kind of out of control here. And if I remember his... Um, his, I mean, he's sort of like a left-wing eco-terrorist in some sense, but he he had a lot to say about the political left oh, yeah. and about how they all have uh, inferiority complexes and fundamentally hate anything like goodness, truth, beauty, justice. It's a politics of, of envy and resentment and 
you know, like I said, 10 minutes ago, they're ashamed of America. And so I remember reading that, like everybody should read it. And what do you agree with? What do you disagree with? But, uh, but he was thinking, and I think he qualifies as subversive. So. Yeah. There, there are certain, out. certain kinds of knowledge that can break a certain type of person. And I feel like maybe he, you know, he looked into the abyss a bit too, too deeply because yeah, yeah, I mean, if you think it through, if you really, you know, play out the, the, <laughs> the iterations, yeah, you get to something really dark. And I think he, yeah, <laughs> he went too far. Yeah. John, John Gray, who I think is not a terrorist. I think he's just a British political philosopher. Yeah, right? philosopher yeah. I remember reading, uh, I think straw dogs or something. And it's like, maybe he looked into the abyss a little bit too, <laughs> too intently too. So like without endorsing that stuff, I do think it's, it's interesting and stuff that most people don't read. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always recommend John Gray. He's he's excellent. He's still a liberal, though. I think he looked so hard and then he, he stepped a bit back before before jumping. So, yeah, he's, you know, kind of tried to hold on to his sanity somehow. Uh, but, yeah, definitely recommend it. And I think I don't know if, if um, Kaczynski was recommended on the show, but I've definitely talked to some people about Kaczynski. So he's one of the people that keeps coming up because, yeah, like you said, people should read the book, especially if you're interested in liberalism. I think he starts with just a huge evisceration of the of the liberal mindset of you know the over socialized you know individual yeah it's a, it's a really good book so yeah definitely recommend it um if you are in Arizona somehow listener please do support Blake vote for Blake um please do uh do as much as you can to uh to um propagate this new generation of uh, of politician um an outsider, you know, the underdog, uh, in, in, in the best of ways. So I'm really happy to have you on. This has been really great. Um, and is there any place that I should point people towards how they can support you watch, listen? Yep. My website is blakemasters.com and I'm on Twitter until they kick me off at BG masters. Excellent. Yeah. We're, we're always on, on borrowed time on Twitter. Most people who come on this show. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. This has been, this has been awesome. Alex, great to see you. Thank you.